Greetings Mechie 102 This is an instructional video for the studio analysis for the impulse and momentum investigation. Uh, what you're seeing here is one of the data files I've opened up and done a little bit of, of preparatory work here, mainly in um, putting in some of the values, the measured values for one of the data runs, um, pre-filled some of the cells here, which may or may not be in the, in the four studio spreadsheet that's provided. Uh, but certainly the graph that I've done here is not provided for you. You'd have to create that. Uh, just to recap a little bit of what's discussed in the pre-studio documentation, uh, remember this investigation concerns one of the cars, the Vernier cars, that has a hoop spring attached to it that has a relatively low speed collision with a barrier. Um, the built-in wheel encoder measures position as a function of time and this was set up to run at 25 samples per second so all these data points are 0 0.04 seconds apart. Um, from that position versus time it numerically the software numerically calculates the velocity and acceleration those are shown here in the columns and then uh, also uh, force is measured from the force sensor built into the car so that is also shown here so this was copied into this sheet and I again built some of the things around it. Um, there's some numbers here, this impulse threshold, Newton seconds, I'll come back to that, what that means in a moment. I'm not sure why this keeps showing that chart title thing there. If I click on that, it'll go away. Um, there are some cells over here on the left that uh, need to be filled in. So the mass of the car is not calculated, that's actually known. Uh, as noted elsewhere, the different, all the, the data files contain in the name of the file the mass of the car for that particular uh, trial, for that particular test. So you would have to copy that in there. It's a relatively simple thing. I've intentionally left that information off here just so that it kept us fairly generic, but you would want to know that and put that in. Uh, these, the rest of these values here that I'm highlighting now need to be calculated. The total impulse, that's what I'm really going to focus on in this video. The velocity before and the velocity after, that's before and after the collision, those you'll have to determine, develop some uh, method by which you'll do so. And then once you know those, the change in momentum is quite easy. It's just the mass times the uh, velocity after minus the velocity before. Let's take a look at the data that we've got here. So I've got, a, I do have a, a, a scatter chart I've created on the right, which is the velocity and the force. Those are things we're mainly interested in. We don't really care about the position that was only there so we could get the velocity and the acceleration we don't need either. Um, this particular investigation is, as the name implies, it's calculating the impulse during the collision and relating it to the change in momentum during the collision. Just a little bit of description about what we're looking at. Um, so if you had watched the video on how this works, there's a beginning part here where I started up the data collection and then I pushed the car. That's what you're seeing where I'm, I'm highlighting now with a cursor here on the chart over on the very beginning time here from t equals zero on to a little distance here. Um, that's where I'm pushing the car. Then there's a relatively flat portion where it's rolling along the track at constant velocity. Um, very low friction, not zero, but very low friction. Force here doesn't really change. It should be zero because there's nothing acting on the, um, the, the holder, the location where the spring attaches to the car, the hoop spring. Actually, even back here where I'm pushing the car and there is a non-zero acceleration of it, the force sensor doesn't measure anything because I didn't push on the spring, I pushed on the back of the car itself. In any event, relatively flat portion where the velocity is more or less constant. Uh, what should be zero, but it's not because there's just a little bit of residual forces measured by the force sensor. But there is a place now right around 0.64 seconds where we see a sharp, well, it's technically mathematically a decrease, but it's an increase in the magnitude of the force down through this peak where we have the actual collision occurring. And then that and increases again, coming back to zero, uh, moving the, the magnitude is decreasing, moving back to where now the car is moving away and the spring is, is no longer compressed. So in other words, where it first starts going to its most negative value at the very bottom of this uh, valley here, that's the most negative value of the force. That's where the spring is fully compressed and the car comes instantaneously to a rest, to, to a to rest. You can actually see that here from the velocity curve. That's where it crosses the zero, the, the time axis here where it becomes zero. That's where it's instantaneously resting. The spring is fully compressed, the maximum negative force. And that's just how this was set up to measure um, then the car starts to be pushed back away from the barrier. The force is increasing here, decreasing its magnitude. The velocity is now moving, the car is moving in the opposite direction, so the velocity goes negative. 
positive velocity was towards the barrier. Um, so now it's it's moving away from the barrier. Uh, the point where this spring, this force now is uh, back to near zero where it was before within its sort of tolerance there, it's, it's dead band. Uh, the velocity now is a, a nearly constant value, um, almost the same as it was previous, but negative. So it was a little above 0.2. Now it's right around minus 0.2, so it's not exactly reversed, but pretty close to it. And then, of course, there's an area where I catch it. So the, the, the bottom line here is what we want to do for this experiment. We want to measure the impulse, which is the integral of the force over time, the impulse during the collision. Graphically on this curve, it represents the area that's contained by this valley here and the time axis. So I would say looking at this, our collision is somewhere between 0.64 seconds and right around 1.04 seconds and you can see you could make some determination what the velocity before is and then the velocity after there is some interpretation subjective interpretation there and that's part of what you'll have to figure out but let's focus on how we calculate this impulse which is the area uh, bounded by that curve in that peak so the pre-studio documentation talks about this so-called trapezoidal rule it's a way for approximating areas that are broken out by these points. So you're basically drawing trapezoids connected by all these points within the, this valley here. Or this, I'll, I'll call it a peak, uh, even though it's a negative peak. Um, we now know the times of interest. It was point, what was it again? 0.64 to 1.04. So we could find those times over here in the uh, data. So basically, those data are the ones that we're interested in specifically. Uh, I'll select these here. Those are the forces during the collision and the corresponding times over here. That's essentially what we're integrating. So we, we really only need to focus on those particular values for this particular data set. But what I'd like to do is, if possible, develop a semi-automatic or as much as possible an automatic sort of analysis here. Uh, reason being, you have 10 of these trials you're supposed to do. Now, it's really not that bad, even if we didn't automate this to go through the 10 trials. It's not difficult. Nonetheless, though, I, I will show you a method by which we can make this semi-automatic. And in doing so here, it kind of show some of the, the real utility of Excel and the formulas and, and the sort of the logic that you can build into them. To get started here, what I'm going to do, I've got a column I've already pre-labeled here called Delta Impulse. What that means is that's going to represent a tiny sliver of the area that's of the of the impulse. So basically, if you again think back to the pre-studio documentation, those trapezoidal segments that made up the the numerical approximation of the integral, that's what these delta impulses are. These values represent each one of those little trapezoidal slices. Again, I only really need to do this in the area where the peak occurs. But if I want to make this automated, I want to actually set it up so that I'm going to calculate these delta impulses for all of the data points. And then I'll make some determination on how I'm going to use it, like if I'm going to add them in or not to my analysis. And the reason for that is what I want to do, the kind of grand scheme of things here, I want to get this spreadsheet, this particular worksheet, set up as much as possible to sort of automate my analysis. Then I can copy that worksheet into a whole new sheet, paste in a different data set, and it will automatically update. And so therefore, the reason why I don't want to just make it fixed only to the times that are in this particular run is because not everyone will have, every one of these runs will have those same times. They won't all start and stop their collisions at the same sort of absolute time uh, markers here. So what I'm going to do then is I'll just fill this in for all of the uh, data points. And the way that works is if you recall from the, the sort of the presentation there of, of the numerical integration, you're taking two points at a time because those are the bounding points on your trapezoidal slice. So I'm going to select the first two rows here. For those first two rows, I can calculate a single delta impulse and then the next two rows and so forth. But the point I'm trying to make by my first selection is that I have two rows, but only one number that's going to come from that. So I have to decide where I'm going to put the number that represents the, the area that's contained under um, that small section of data. I'll decide just to put it in the first cell here. So I'm going to enter the formula. If you recall, it's equal to calculate this. It's just simply the average of the heights, which are the forces, times the width, which is the delta t. So this would be equal to the two forces in those adjoining 
rows divided by 2, so that's the average, times my delta t, and let me make sure I hit F4 so I fix that reference. By the way, with the order of operations here, it does divide by 2, then multiply, although it wouldn't matter what order it did it in. Um, I don't need to put any other parentheses or anything in there. So if the forces, and they're not, you can see right here the force from the chart, or even just look at the numbers here. These, these values to begin with here, until I actually hit the collision time, should be zero. I did zero the force sensor, but it just has enough drift in it that it's not zero. If it were, then that delta impulse would be zero there. It's not, uh, which is a little bit of a hassle. Uh, let me copy this down, and I want to show something to you. I'm actually going to go, well, I'll do it, even though I'm not, I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't go all the way to the bottom, and I'll show you why. If you double click on that last cell, we saw something like this when we were doing the finite difference approximations to the derivatives. Because it's using the current row and the next, I don't go to the to the very end row here because it's calculating an area that doesn't exist. So remember, because when I started at the beginning, the first two rows gave me only one number for delta impulse that I put in the first row. So that means this very last one here, I'll put my to standard hyphen or apostrophe and then the three hyphens, uh, just to say that I'm not calculating anything there. There isn't there isn't an area to calculate there the number that's in the previous row is the area for these two data points. So if the forces truly were zero outside the collision, then all these impulses, these delta impulses outside the collision would be zero. And I'd have a really simple time of this because then all I would have to do is add up all this whole column and I would get the total impulse just for the collision because the impulse out of the collision and these other small portions would, have, would be zero if the, if the force was zero, and I'd only have non-zero forces during the collision. But since they aren't zero, I can't do that. I can't just add everything up because I'll bias it. I'll have an, a, a lot of these tiny little areas that I shouldn't have. So what I want to do is, is find a way that I can only just consider the ones that are in the collision here. And I'll do that by saying, well, if I look at these, um, even though they're not zero, they are fairly small in magnitude until, remember, my first point in the collision was at 0.64. So if I come in here, those are, that's, those are the first uh, two uh, times that I'm going to integrate between here. So here's my first value, minus 0 0.004. That's the first one I want to consider because that would actually be between the, the time 0.64 and 0.68. So it's saying that the, that area, which almost looks like a triangle there, is minus 0 0.004 newton seconds. I do want to include that. I don't want to include the minus 0 0.0008. So if you do enough of these and look through enough of these trials, you can determine that there is a what I'll call a threshold, a value of the impulse that's given by this non-zero sort of uh, bias that's in the force sensor. And that's, if I go back to the top left, what I'm calling this impulse threshold. I'm saying here, I put in this number 0 0.002, I've determined this heuristically, which means I've just looked through all of the analyses for a bunch of these and, and kind of decided that that number represents a cutoff, that any of these delta impulses that are less than that are probably due to bias that's in the force sensor and, it, that, and not coming from the interaction between the spring and the barrier and all of that. And any that's greater than that in magnitude uh, is probably worth considering. So here's what I want to do. I want to put then over in this next column that I've labeled collision with a question mark, a test that compares the delta impulse value in each row to that threshold and ask the question, is the magnitude greater than that threshold or not? And that's how I'll determine whether or not I consider it for analysis. So let me come up to the top cell here and I'm going to put in a formula equals if. So I'm going to use the built-in sort of uh, logical comparison or decision-making capabilities that are in Excel here. It says if you type if equals if, it tells you in a pop-up, checks whether a condition is met and returns one value if true and another value if false. So you can actually enter one of two values here depending upon a condition that's tested. Open parentheses and it gives you another little pop-up here. Uh, first thing you enter is the logical test. So here's what my logical test is. I want to ask if the absolute value, ABS, of this delta impulse, so I want the magnitude of that, is it greater than 
my impulse threshold. And again, I'll hit F4 to fix that reference. So that's how I'm determining whether or not it's big enough for me to worry about it in magnitude. If that's true, then it is big enough that I want to worry about it. And there's a number of different ways I could approach all this. All I'm simply going to do here is just put in the word true. Now, this it's actually when it's done here, in this particular case, it's, it's going to come back and say false. I haven't finished this yet, but the point is it's, it's going to actually put a word in this cell either. It's either going to say true or it's going to say false. Ordinarily, to have text like that in a cell, you would have to put the text in, in, in uh, excuse me, in uh, quotations to indicate its text. But the word true and the word false both have special meaning here in Excel. It recognizes them as Boolean variables. So it, actually, I can just leave them without the uh, quotations. So then I'll say, if that is false instead, I'll actually write the word false in here. And I'll, I think that it's best if I just finish this and I'll hit enter and I'll show you what it does. So it does write all in caps false. Because indeed, this magnitude of the delta impulse there is 0 0.0008. It is less than 0 0.002. So it failed the condition. Remember, we asked if it was greater than. So it fails that it says false. And let me just copy this down. And again, I go all the way down to just the adjacent cells that have the numbers. And I'll copy that, uh, sort of the blank one in the end here. What this is doing is indicating where the impulse, that delta impulse, is great enough that I want to care about it. That it, that I that I'm assuming it's not just due to these uh, these these uh, biases bias that's in the the force sensor, and it actually is due to a, a a larger magnitude force from the collision. Actually, if I just kind of trace this over and keep track of that. Looks like it's 0 .0, or 0 0.640. It actually goes to 1, to 0.96. So it doesn't go quite like I had said before when I was looking at this that I thought it, that the collision really goes out to maybe 1.04. Here's the time. I'm floating my cursor over that. There's one second. And then now I've got down here 0 0.960 if you see when you float over the point in the, in the scatter chart. So what's going on here? A um, couple things. So as it turns out, um, this remember these values that we're calculating like let me let me select this last row where it says true the delta impulse there was minus 0 0.00580 so that magnitude is greater than our threshold the next one is uh minus 0 0.0014 that's not greater than the threshold so then that's where it stopped but remember that the row i've selected here the value the minus 0 0.00580 that's actually for the little sliver of the area that's between 0 0.960 and 1. So even though it stopped, it, didn't, it says true only up to 0 0.960, the area is calculated all the way out to 1, to 1 second, which is right where my cursor it won't show up because it keeps instead indicating the horizontal axis there. But where my cursor is on that point is really um, the 1 second mark. So it does include the area that goes all the way from the 0.64 all the way over to 1, at least where it says true, right? It, it includes the, the, the time values or the data points that would bound that. So it's missing the little bit of error between 1 and 1.04 seconds. That's not very much, so I'm going to say that's fine. Uh, I could change my, thresh, my threshold and, and make it pick that up, but then I run the risk of maybe picking up some other ones over here. I'm going to leave it as it is. I think that's certainly within the realm of acceptable error that's here. So what I'm saying is if I now take where it's all these that say true, if I then highlight these numbers next to it, to where it says true and the delta impulses, those are all the areas I want to add up, the little slivers of area, the trappers always said, if I add all them up, I'm going to get what is the impulse within this slight error anyway of that peak of, of those forces. So you need to add all those up. Now, if you go, come down to the to the bottom where my cursor is, I don't know if you can see it or not, um, and towards the bottom right of the Excel window, it has some kind of quick feedback here when you select cells. It tells me that there are nine of them selected. It tells me the average. It says the sum is minus 0 0.16860. So let me write that down over here for the uh, total impulse, minus 0 0.16860. Okay? So that is the total impulse.
So we did that by it's somewhat automated here. I mean, now that it, it will automatically kind of calculate where I need to pay attention to the values and I can select them and it'll, it'll calculate that. Um, it's still kind of crude because I'm, I'm looking down at uh, a, a feedback here, a little a value at the bottom of the window to add that, to, to find the sum and enter it in the cell, but it does work. Um, there's other ways we could do this, and I'll show you another method. So that what I just showed you is perfectly fine. If you wanted to stop and do it like that, it's, it's still a little bit automated in the sense that if I then pasted other data in, to, for time, position, velocity, acceleration, force, all of those things, paste it in. The columns with delta impulse and the collision would automatically update wherever these values now have shifted. The trues will shift, and I could repeat the process fairly easily. I will just show you there is another way to do this. There is a built-in function in Excel called SUMIF, so equals S-U-M-I-F, and so it builds together the notion of summing things and the if statement. So it will conditionally sum things. As it says, add the cell specified by a given condition or criteria. And you can have an entire, so what the, the idea is you would have matched up columns here. Columns of numbers you're gonna conditionally add and a column of conditions to test against. And we already have that. We have all our delta impulses that we want to conditionally add. We have the, co the column of all these true falses for the collision question, so we're, we're really there. So I'll say open parentheses. It's not, the, it's not the clearest feedback here, but it's asking for a range, a criteria, and a sum range. What those mean is that those things refer to, the first range means where's all the stuff you're testing. The criteria is what is the test? And then the sum range means where are the numbers you're going to conditionally sum. So the first thing I'm going to select is my column of true falses. Okay, comma. What's my criteria? Well, this one's fairly simple. In other words, it says, what about the stuff inside that column you just selected will determine if you use it or not? Well, in this case, I want to use them if it says true. So I can say that fairly simply. And again, I don't need to do any kind of uh, special considerations here because true, that word true is something Excel has a special recognition of. And then I have to select the column that has all the numbers that I'll be conditionally adding. So I'll select them, close parentheses, enter, and there, lo and behold, I get the exact same number that I showed you before, minus 0.1686, we should. So basically what it's done is it's only added up the numbers in the column of the delta impulses where there were true, valid value true in the conditional column here. So that's a pretty automated approach to this. Uh, it works fairly well there. It, I could shift the impulse threshold here if I wanted to. If I made this point 001, it would pick up that last little sliver that's in there. Um, I'm not gonna do that though, because I think overall, I don't wanna run the risk of maybe catching some of these other things here that I don't want included. And by the way, now that I've done this, uh, by putting in my formula the sum if, if any of these other ones happen to pop up true, just by just happen to, to, to come up above the threshold, I would add them in. So I gotta be careful with that. Uh, I will warn you, if you are doing some of the other uh, trials, the, the test runs with other masses, you may need to pay attention to that imp impulse threshold, make sure it's still good. And here's one way I wanna, something else I wanna show you. Um, to kind of help indicate where you should be paying attention to the values and making sure that this has worked fairly well at a glance. I'm going to come in here and select all these values again that say true, false, that column of conditional values. I'd like to make it so that wherever it says true, it really stands out so it catches the eye and it's easier to kind of see that at a glance. So one way you can do that, I don't want to just, again, I don't want to go in and just manually and permanently format the ones that say true here, because then if I put other data in and it shifts where that's located, if I just did the cells with where it says true right now, that wouldn't update, right? So instead I'm going to use something called conditional formatting, and I'll just show this to you. Let's go down and we'll say new rule. So this actually is fairly powerful. There's a lot of options in here of things to do. I'm just gonna show you a fairly simple one. I'm gonna say format only cells that contain. So it's, it's, it's quite simple. I'm just gonna say if, it, if the cell has the value true in it, then do the following format. I'm nothing more sophisticated than that. I mean, you can look through these other ones if you wanna see. Um, it is extremely powerful actually for sort of visualization of data in different ways, but in any event, format only cells that contain cell value 
equal to true. And again, because it's this special word recognition, I don't need to, I don't have to capitalize or put quotes or any of that. Otherwise you would, if you were looking for a word like Monday, you would likely have to put quotes in there. But anyway, so the cells that are true, I'm gonna click on format and I'll make them, uh, maybe I'll make the fill purple and I'll make the font white and I'll make it bold. So if I hit OK, you'll see what it'll do. And then I'll hit OK again. And now you can see the cells that have true in them have at format applied. And I'm going to do this. You don't want to do this in general. But if I put true, if I type true in another cell, it automatically applies the formatting there. So I'm going to undo that. I just wanted to show you what that conditional formatting meant and how, therefore, it will shift where that happens. I don't have to. I'm not. I'm not manually or, or sort of permanently applying the format to a particular cell. It's a, it's applying the format to the cell based upon the contents, so it's different. But now you can clearly see, and at a glance you could check other ones to make sure that it, you don't have spurious places that say true elsewhere just because of maybe a, a tolerance that's too low or something like that. Um, so that's the, the upshot of this. I am not going to talk about how you would do the velocity. That's up to you. But you are getting close to being able to do that. Because again, where the first true is located, you just kind of mark over here. The velocity there, in this case, is 0.220. That point and earlier in this sort of range in here, all of those are, are representative values and maybe some more. You could have to you could look at your chart here to see. But you could determine a representative velocity before based upon those values, however you want to do that. I will warn you at the other end, though, you have to be careful because remember, if I trace across here now, that is actually measuring the um, impulse at this row and the next time, right? So in other words, and let's see, it's the third column is velocity. The value, the minus 2, 0 0.2090, that is still in the collision technically because that's the velocity that's right at one second. So it's still, I mean, it, it does look like it's leveled off pretty good, but technically that velocity, the minus 0 0.2090, is still in the collision, involved in the collision. So the first after collision velocity is actually the next row. Oh, actually, sorry, it is that one. Sorry, I apologize. If I, if I scroll across, sorry, if I mark across here from the last true, it's the minus point 0.1930, excuse me. Um, that's still in the collision, right? It's the next point after it that's after the collision. So let me reiterate here. Again, I apologize if that was unclear. The first true that appears, the velocity that's in that row, that time, is still right at the end of the, the before collision. That is still technically right before the collision has occurred by our kind of uh, setup here. So that and, and previous represent uh, before collision velocities, velocities before. The last true that's shown, if you come across in that row at that time, the velocity that appears there is not a velocity after it's still technically in the collision it's the next time the next row that begins the velocity after and on so just be aware of that that's a pretty important one so again I won't go any more than I won't say any more than that you'll have to determine some method by which you want to uh, determine what is the velocity before and the velocity after it doesn't have to be automated um, I'll tell you it would it might be a little difficult to do that since it's not as clear cut right there's no threshold or anything you can apply there again you do have some trues over here that to indicate that but to connect up a true value there to how you're marking things over here is, is a little bit more complicated um, but however you do it that's up to you we are not asking you to tell us how you do it but you have to know because there will be a lab report, uh, one of the later lab reports, where you will have to work with that. So you, at that point, you will have to tell us how you did that. Uh, so again, you you can fill in those velocity values, use the equation for the delta momentum. You'll have the mass of the car that you can fill in. So after you do one of these sheets, you could go to your summary sheet, and that could be one of your trial numbers here, where you can fill in all those results across, and you'll do that nine more times. To do that nine more times, what you can do is once you've got this all functioning the way you like, you can move or copy. 
put a check by create a copy. I'll say move to end so it puts it on the right hand side of it. So now you have two exact copies of the same sheet. If you double click in the sheet name down here at the bottom, I'll ch change that to say trial number two. I happen to have open already another data set. So this is another trial. I'll come in here and collect and select all the data. Control C to copy it. Come back to my previous. And now I'm going to come in here, select all the data. Actually, I actually don't have to select them all. I could just do the first row, but I will. And then I'm going to say paste special. I'm going to paste the values only. So now I hope you saw when I did that, everything else updated here, right? My chart changed. So everything actually, the collision shifted over. Um, well, yeah, it did shift over in time to 0 0.880 now as a start point, And it looks like my last time here, well, we'll see if it's 1.44 or if it's 1.4, depends on how that little last bit gets counted. Not as wide of a plateau area here where we had the velocity before or after. So um, looks like I, I had a little bit of a delay here before I made the car move. And so there's some part here at the beginning that was sort of wasted time on the test, but it doesn't matter. We still got a good set of data. Um, so what did I say? 0 0.880. So let's see, 0 0.880, yep. And it comes down to 1.4. So in this case, it does go to the 1.4, but remember the last point actually that's indicated as true includes the next time as well. So it does go all the way 1.440. And so just to check here, add those deltas up. Minus 0.617, that is what shows up here. So good, that's the general idea here, that how you can keep applying this to your other trials. And it should be mostly automated, depends upon how you do your velocity, but even if you still manually do your velocity determinations, at least the impulse is done automatically. And at least you have a way that you can easily pick out the area that here that's the collision times and then work for your velocities from there. So again, you would do this for multiple trials, complete your summary table, and that would uh, satisfy the analysis for this impulse and momentum investigation. Thanks for watching.